This is Mitch, and welcome to the 1000houses.com podcast. I'm here today with Danny Kerr. We're going to be talking about how to recruit people so you don't have to work so hard and so that you can get more done and be more profitable. Um, so before we start, I'd like to pay homage to my sponsor, taxfreefuture.com. If you do not have a tax deferred or tax free retirement account in which to grow your retirement funds or your finances, you are missing a huge tool in your tool belt. So please go to taxfreefuture.com where you will learn about self-directed IRAs, 401ks, health savings accounts, educational accounts, just uh, all kinds of tools so that you can get ahead and, and grow your, grow your finances uh, tax deferred so, or tax free. So check it out. And okay, Danny, I've paid the bills. So how are you doing today? <laughs> Good, man. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm just hanging out in Canada. So so it's cool. Last time we talked, it's been a while, but uh, you were specializes in stepping into businesses and help them see the forest despite the trees, right? To, to, to get in there and figure out where the sticking points are or where the bottleneck is or and uh, just help people be able to improve the flow of their business and their business processes right totally that is our world yeah. what we do every day so yeah and so you even helped one of my students ben grice over there in indiana i think it is and uh, uh he signed on shortly after our conversation got posted and um how did that go it went really well yeah he uh i think when we first met with him he was he had a small team and he was just trying to figure out like how do i step away from just doing a lot of this myself and really delegate down to you know an organization of people and He's quite out of the day to day now. I mean, it's uh, sitting down with him. It's night and day. He's got a real business under his hands now versus just him flipping homes. So it's cool to watch. And yeah, he's still with us to this day and kind of working on the next level even as we speak. So good. Um, I, I really like stories like that because, you know, Ben came on and he was a one man show and was doing some wholesaling and flipping, which is an endless, you know, rinse and repeat job. And so, you know, got him turned on to some ways to generate some cash flow. And he's a real, he's a real success story. Young guy, uh, sharp, asked a lot of questions, uh, implementer. And uh, he's come a million miles in the last four years. That's key, man. There's a lot of people that will listen to what you say. There's very few will actually do it, but look what yeah. happens. In the day. What do you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm even guilty of that sometimes, you know, like I heard what he said. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, um, let's, let's, let's have a conversation today about, you know, we got a lot of, this business seems to be notorious for one man show, you know, a, a one man entrepreneur shops, you know, where they're out flipping or wholesaling and people really don't get it for a while. I didn't get it for way too long that the money's only in a couple of key things that you do well and everything else should probably be delegated out and you think that that's an expense but it's not really expense explain that dynamic yeah um you know the first thing actually it's interesting you bring that exactly that up but one of the first things i, I talk to people about and just get them to think about is what are all the things you do in a week cool circle the stuff that's highest time consumption and lowest skill what are those things? And there's usually a pattern, whether that's administrative stuff, whether that's, you know, managing some of the projects, whether that's sales driven stuff. And it's looking at that and saying, that is probably the next most ideal role for your organization with the, you know, the lowest hanging fruit with the biggest ROI. And if you look at what an owner's worth in their business, when they first start, I mean, they got to be the center of everything. They got to grind it out and figure it out. But after a while, it gets to a point where they're doing a lot of tasks that could probably be hired out for, you know, 15, 20, $30 an hour jobs. And when they look at how much they're making, I'm like, why? Like that's actually costing you money to go out there and do a lot of those things. And so it's having people realize and see that people are not a cost to business. They're an asset, right? And often they're the biggest asset to the entire organization. And you know, you can't build everything yourself. <laughs> you just, you'll go, you'll go, you'll get exhausted. And I, and I've done this before. Like I, I remember when I first started a, a painting company years ago and I was 18 years old, I was working 80 hours a week and you know, I had a small crew of painters and it's not that I had zero employees, but I just, I was trying to manage the sales, the production, the financials, like make, you know, get everything under my wing and I burnt out. I couldn't do it anymore. There was just no more me to give. And 
I slowly realized like if I put, put in a project manager who is pure overhead, you know, really, what can I do? Well, I went and doubled my sales, right? And all of a sudden that project manager, as much as they may not deliver an ROI to the company directly by booking more work, it gave me the freedom to be able to go do that, right? Um, even Breakthrough Academy, the company we have now, the first person we ever hired, uh, her name is Caitlin Kaufman. She's still with us to this day. And she did administration for me. And I just realized like, I'm very good at getting out there and speaking and doing my thing, but I suck at administration. So why am I spending all my time doing it when I get someone else who loves to do it, who's better at it than me anyways, and free me up to do what I'm great at. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I thought, I thought when I wanted to walk away from my business, I was going to take a million dollars worth of income. I'm just pulling a random number out of the air right here. It's a little bit more than that, but million dollars, uh, you know, profit a year. And I was going to give up 500,000 of it so that I could at least keep 500 myself and not walk away and get zero. But I was going to have to pay these. I, I was willing to pay these people really good not to walk away from a business and zero out at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to give up half of what I was making. And turns out <laughs> I made more than I made before. I made more than I made when I was the one man show, you know, hiring these people and, and acquiring this overhead, I made personally myself more that year than I did. And every year after that, because I figured it out, this is not a secret, but I'm a slow learner, uh, you know, Danny. So I figured it out because I was better at all of those people in that chair. Like if they were a salesman, I was a better salesman than them. I knew my product better. I was more enthusiastic about my product. I had a bigger why than them, but I wasn't as good as them because I had to do everything else. And there's only just this little sliver of me that could go to sales. And, and so they were, all they had to do was one thing was totally. sales. And so they, they were, they were much better at it than, than me, uh, given the circumstances, you know, and that happened in every chair, you know? Totally. And then finally I got to, you know, got freed up, like you said, like in your example, and I got freed up. And I thought, where's the best use of my time? And my, my best use was to find the private money to fund it because my partner was handling the acquisitions and the, and the sales people. Mm -hmm. There was nothing for me to do. So I went and started acquiring private money and pushing the limits at what terms people would loan me, how long and, and how little interest rate and all that. I started pushing, pushing. Today I have um, $26 million out on the street right now. Yeah. And very favorable, you know, 15 year wrappable mortgages. Cause I, I, I sell my houses on wraparound notes, you know, uh, I carry the financing. So anyways, what, what's one of the secrets? Like I was the worst hire. I was the worst hiring person in the world. I would hire people and they would, they would be horrible. Yeah. Um, what are you looking for in a person when you, when you, when you go to hire them and, and what are the indicators that they're going to, be productive and be uh, what you what you're looking for. Yeah, there's there's actually ten we teach. There's ten that I learned years ago that matter. And there, it's funny that very only one out of those ten actually has to do with their skill or their experience. A lot of it had to do with things like attainment, their preference to set and hit goals, which is huge for salespeople. Um, fundamental. Anyone managing parts of your business, they need to be able to handle stress in pursuit of a goal. That's actually the biggest one I've seen in people like that. Uh, you ever watch somebody manage a company with you? And suddenly shit hits the fan and they're MIA, that's fundamental, right? And you're like, why did I even hire you? I'm babysitting you and now you don't even show up when I really need you. So that's a big one for anyone you're helping you or is helping you manage the company. Um, leadership's a pretty obvious one if you're going to have people leading others. Um, introspection is huge, um, especially if you're hiring people with lower skill and you really need to build into them over time. They have to be able to objectively view themselves and how they take feedback, right? And um, so we often, there's a few more of them, but we often as, as a company teach our people not to focus in on what skills people have. We'll, we'll do that later in the interview, but much more important, like what personality preferences and styles does this person live by? Because you can't change those. Those are just baked into who they are. And off of that, off the right kind of, you know, personality makeup, you can train the right person, anything you need to do or anything that they would need to do. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, ultimately we, we look a lot more at that generally and to do that properly, you need to make sure that you, right from the get-go, if you, if you know kind of roughly who you're looking for, you need to reverse engineer the entire recruiting process to find that person. And it's funny enough, very similar to like a sales process. So if you're like, these are the perfect kind of customers, or these are the perfect kind of people I, I love to work with, 
well, you want to think about like, where do those people hang out? What do those people care about? What are those people, you know, thinking about what are those, what would draw those people in and very similar to recruitment. You need to build like a sales and marketing process to do that. Um, only problem is most people don't because they're focused on sales and they're saying to themselves, sales is the number one thing that'll drive my business. And that, and that's true to a point, but that changes as you grow to the next level. And it's all about developing people. And that becomes the core element. The skill of that will drive the business. So you said it was the 10, the 10, the 10, what did you call it? 10? Just attributes or personality. Yeah. Okay. 10 attributes. Um, So you had the fundamentals, leadership, introspection. Can you give us a few more of those? So another big one is just tenacity. Having people that are like, enjoy hard work. They they enjoy the challenge of pushing themselves and working out there day to day um, and putting in long hours. Um, Big ones, problem solving. We've all had those people who you hire and they call you for every dumb little thing that could ever happen on a job site or happen on a sales call, or it's like you need people who are dynamic in their thinking. Um, that just mitigates obviously a lot of the babysitting. Office people is high, need to be high in precision. I think that's pretty obvious, but can often be overlooked because you have someone who's very charismatic. You're like, this person would be really good at just getting along with the team and taking, you know, fielding client calls, but like, great. Ultimately, like, how do they organize my QuickBooks? How are they going to take care of the financials that are coming in and out of the, 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 uh, the office day to day? How are they going to you know, manage our projects and things like that? So precision is huge. And it's, I'll tell you, it's one thing for salespeople, they don't often have. So one thing we've often done is if we have a big enough sales team, we will allocate a administrator to the sales team to allow them to, again, do what they're great at and let this other person do what they're good at, which is take care of the details in the back end. So that's a big one. Um, one that, everybody gets interviewed on that we ever bring into our organization. And for a lot of the guys we coach is values. And we talk, everyone talks a little bit about that, but what, what's going on is if you have somebody who has, and it's not about having good values or bad values. It's like, do the values of them align with the company itself? Right? Because sometimes you'll hire somebody. I'm sure we've all had this too. You hire somebody who's like a rock star and they're killing it, but they're doing it in a way that's kind of pissing you off the whole time. It's like, that's not okay. You're not like, that's not how we do it. But like, they get good results. And so you have to watch for that. And if they don't have good values, it doesn't matter how well they perform over time. They, they usually don't last. So I'm a big on the values, the integrity of the thing. I, I, I can't, I can't spend any time worrying about this guy's, this person's doing the right thing. You know what I mean? I, that just kills me. Totally. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few other ones. Instrumentals, another one on just overall, like how do these people present themselves? Do they come across as highly competent? Do they come across as responsible? These are going to be the people that are going to interact with your public audience. And so they are representing your brand. And is that the type of person you want representing your brand? Um, so there's lots of little ways to, to look for these things. Like I know precision, it's, an, it's, a, it's a sneaky thing to do, but after you're done the interview and you can still ask specific questions about how they organize their time and their calendar and their life and the big projects they've, they've project managed over time. But one thing I always do after the interview is I'll walk to their car with them and I'll shake their hand and say goodbye and I'll just look in their vehicle. Is it a complete garbage mess or is it like nice and tidy and clean and everything's pr- pristine? People who have a natural pr- preference for high precision are, are, are usually OCD and like, they can't handle, you know, even a speck of dust on their car, right? So anyways, li- little things like that you can look for, but the interview itself is the specific questions we get people to ask, which I think we'll talk about it later, but I, I gave uh, a download form for uh, your show notes. So we'll give everybody a little download on this exact interview process and the questions they need to ask. So, but yeah. Okay. So, um, so you're going to, there's a, I guess, I guess you just added to the giveaways because you were going to give away a 30 minute meeting to address your business and, and build a checklist of what uh, your caller might need to focus on in their business. Right. So that's, yeah, if we're going to talk recruiting today, I'll, I have a recruiting package. I'll get the team to add as well. So that kind of goes through like how to do a setup call properly, how to do an interview properly, um, how to set up an ideal candidate profile. I'll go through some of these tactics as we go today, but I'll give a little package people can utilize from what we talk about. Okay, that's good. So I want everyone to go to 1000houses.com forward slash breakthrough, B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-G-H, breakthrough. All right. It's right there behind his head. Breakthrough. <laughs> uh, and when you're, what, where do you run your ads to get all this stuff done? Where do you, where do you place these pleas you know, for help? You know what, before we even talk about that, one thing I'll get into a little bit is understanding what to put in your ad. Oh yeah, no, that, yeah. fine. Because I was headed there too. <laughs> cool. So actually I'll go one more step back. I want, I want to set some context for all this. Cause this is what I'm about to say is a bit of work and people often are like, that's a lot of work. I'm good. I'll just like do it my way. 
here's the reality. In 2008, what was the big like hard thing to get? What was every entrepreneur trying to do more of? 2008, they were trying to get money, weren't they? Totally. There was no money. What are we in the recession now of? We're in the recession of? People. People, yeah. There's no good people out there and there's very few anyways. And you think about the amount of hustle and time and effort that it took to, in 2008 to get you know, the jobs you wanted to get and to get the work you needed to get. That same mentality needs to be applied to recruitment. And a company who understands recruiting at a high level will outbeat their competition all day long. But if they're just like everybody else, they're going to struggle just like everybody else. And so I always encourage people as I go through even this process with you, just to realize right now in the economy we're in, that is the skill to hone in on if you really want to build a true organization over time. Because you, you can throw ads out there all day long and get someone to apply and you know hire the second person that comes through the door because they had a heartbeat and a, you know, a willingness to go try the job. But if you really want to build a lasting team, you need to understand the mechanics of it and put quite a bit of time and effort into it. Um, there's a time in my life I was recruiting for franchises and I would bring in about 150 student franchises a year. And the effort that it took to do that was a game changer for my skill set in recruitment. And it's a driven, not only my organization, but most of the companies we work with today where they're realizing, yeah, we got more work coming in than we can handle, but we just can't get the people to do it. So anyway. I think, I think people kind of said that there's a scarcity of people, but I think it's a great time to go find some good people and tell me if my rationale is right or wrong, because a lot of really good people have gotten let and go. They've got, <laughs> they've got let go. And while some of them may choose to sit on their butt and collect the unemployment check or whatever, others are the one that you want. He's like, I, I don't want an employment. I need a job. That's yep. the one you want, you know, and, and, and there's people out there like that. Like if it was me, I would, I would be, yeah, unemployment's one thing, but I, I'd rather just have my job. I got, I got stuff I need to learn and places I need to go. And I can't do that sitting on employment, you know, unemployment. So. Yeah, and you also have $26 million in the marketplace because you're super motivated. <laughs> yeah. a, lot, a lot of people will take the, the, the easy route, right? And there's only a few that won't. And those are the people you want to find. And so it's not about just getting, you know, someone who's you know, willing to work a little bit. It's about finding a, a person who's looking for a career. And what I've realized over the years is that it's just like a draft pick for a sports team, right? There's a whole draft season to, to finding your, your right team to go on the bench for the next fiscal year. And so like I usually from September to January would be on a quite a recruiting stint and everyone might have different seasons and some people might just be recruiting all year. But the first thing I do is I build my budget. I figure out what my financials need to look like in a year from now. I then off of that say, you know what? I can't do all of that for sales or I can't do all of that for project management or I, I can't handle all the office stuff. I need X, Y, Z roles. So I start to decide which roles I need a year ahead of time. And so I'll be like, hey, $50,000 budget for, for that person's salary, $80,000 budget for that person's salary. Can I afford it? Cool. Okay, once I'm confident for that, I now have a year to insert those people into my organization. And then I start my recruiting process. And so I'll look at what are the ideal traits um, of the person I'm trying to attract? So some of the stuff I was just talking about with recruiting. And then I'll say, okay, well, what is that type of person looking for? And instead of trying to put out an ad where it's like, this is all about me and what I need as an owner, I'm thinking about what does that person want and look for and need and turn the table a bit and turn it into a bit of a sales and marketing ad to attract or draw that person in. So a good example of this is years ago uh, when my painting company was, was running, I was looking for another project manager and I sat down with my current one and I said, Hey man, like I love what you, who you are and I need to clone you. Um, what are, like, just tell me about, about more about you. Like, what do you love about this job? What do you hate about this job? What gets you up in the morning? Why'd you start with me? And the things that came out of his mouth was interesting because he was just like, you know, I love that you're my, my coach more than you're my boss. You know, I love that you give me autonomy to set and hit goals and make bonuses off of those. I love that you basically give me a team to drive and lead and be, to be able to strategize, you know, how, how to get things done. And he's like, Danny, I'm, I'm the quarterback on the football team in high school. Like, I just get to use that same mentality on the painting field with you and actually make money doing it. And I realized that, you know, my ad before said like need project manager, you know, drive company truck, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I changed it to like need a quarterback to take our painting teams home. Sick of a boss, wish you had more of a coach, looking for autonomy and freedom to work in your role, looking for bonuses that reflect your efforts. Like I, I spoke to the athlete and people. And what I started to get was more of those types of people. Actually, physically, I got more athletes that applied for me and their genetic makeup of who they are and their personality traits were much more relevant to the type of skill I was looking for to be able to drive my organization forward. And, and they weren't the greatest painters, to be honest. 
but they were, they had the right personality traits for me to be able to build into them long-term. So that was the first step. Before I even posted an ad, I spent that t- type of time interviewing my, my key people. And even if you don't have someone in your business already that you can interview, like look out at your network and say, who's someone I would love that's probably not going to come on board with me, but I could at least interview them to find out what, how they tick. So I could use their mentality and put that out into an ad properly. So that's the first step. When you're done that, so go ahead. I think that it's interesting how um, I always, I liked a certain ex-military person because they have this, they have this, um, it's been drilled into them, you know, up early, whatever it takes, yes or no, sir, respect, not tomorrow, now, you know, and then I like, I like athletes because they, they, um, they don't quit easy. Yep. You know, they just, they, 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 they've been in, they've been in very uncomfortable positions many times, you know? Totally. And, uh, so I didn't think about, uh, appealing to the athletes as much. Okay. So, uh, what next? Where are we headed? Cool. So you got your ad, you're ready to put it out. Okay. Think about this like fishing too. It's kind of like, what are the traits of the fish? Kate, now we figured out the lure that's going to attract this fish. Now we have to figure out what ponds we're going to go fish in. So this is the tactic side. So you want to think through like, where do these people hang out? Where, where do they, where do their eyes go? And for a lot of people, it's pretty obvious, you know, things like Facebook, you know, more professional roles are out on LinkedIn. We've got the standard, you know, zip recruiter, indeed, things like that. And the ones that I find work the best are the ones where I'm actually doing the outreach. So let me explain this. First one would be, you know, if you're looking for more of an office role or more of a professional role, um, LinkedIn is amazing. Um, we pay for LinkedIn recruiter. I think it costs us about a thousand bucks a month. Some people will be like, that's a lot of money. I'd be like, not for the type of people you need. You know, they're going to create a much higher ROI long-term. Um, we will have a message go out about 200 messages a day go out that basically just connect with people, click to connect with people. We'll just, everyone will do a, an advanced search on a certain demographic of people in a certain area with a certain job title or a certain past history. So you can do this with the advanced search through LinkedIn recruiter. And then we'll just click to connect with 200 of them. We'll let 30 roughly percent of them usually, you know, accept the connection. And then we send them a message and says, Hey, so-and-so, you know, I noticed your, and we send a personalized, like, Hey, I noticed you worked for so-and-so for five years. That's really awesome. I think they do great training. Um, our company XYZ is looking for a person in an XYZ role. Curious if you know anybody who'd be a good fit, please see link below. And we'd have that recruiting ad ready for them to read. You know, PS we're offering a $500 hiring bonus. Uh, if you know anybody would love to share that with you or thousand bucks or 2000 bucks, whatever. And so what you're doing is you're not, kind of like saying, would you be a good fit? Cause that's pretty aggressive and people get thrown off by that. You're just saying, yeah. and you're that's letting them self identify or maybe refer you because they might have the network of similar minded people. Well, they'll plug themselves in if they want the job, right? Totally. So we do that on LinkedIn. Um, if you have a bit of a team slash, you should do this on your own as well. We do it on Facebook as well, except we direct message people. So we will have, you know, I have 25 staff right now. We'll have them all do about hundred to 200 messages each. It's the exact same message. Hey, so-and-so our company XYZ is looking for a person XYZ role. Cares if you know anybody, see link below, you know, PS we're offering a $500 hiring bonus. And I have 25 staff. That's 2,500 direct Facebook messages that go out to people's network. And they message to people they think would be a good fit they think would have a good network of people that'd be a good fit or people that just generally have a good relationship with. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an amazing world we live in. Some, you just have to ask for what you're looking for. Chances are you'll find it because of, totally. the, of the way we can connect these days. So, um, so what does it take to uh, generate a bunch of good resume applicants? I mean, I guess, I guess that's the, uh, the, the bottom line is just how you're wording your, your ad comes a lot down to the, to, to the, what you put in your ad. It comes a lot down to the time and money and effort you put into it. You know, I might do that and get no results. Well, it doesn't mean it's over. It means I've got an entire year to still recruit. So what am I doing every single week to keep that mentality, keep that pushing forward, right? I might have a certain ad spend on Indeed. I might have a certain ad spend on, um, on Craigslist. I'm like, I'm putting my, I call it waves and webs. I'm putting my web out quite broad and I'm doing it every like, you know, a couple weeks through, through waves and waves and waves of doing it. And I think over time, the right person comes along. But if you're in a rush to recruit and you're like, in the next two weeks, I need to hire somebody. I had two, you know, three people apply, two people I set up for an interview. One guy actually showed up and he wasn't high on drugs. Let's hire that guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. You, no, you, you need to wait. One thing we learned from my, my, my business partner, Mike Powell, his, his father, like when it's a pretty important position, we don't, 
we don't really go out and, and, and try to invent that person or we just find out who's already really good at it in some other organization and we just go poach them. We just, you know, like go to that organization or, or do what you basically what you said, ask that person that we really want if they know somebody who wants, <laughs> wants this job. Um, you know, usually we know what they're making or we know close to and we set our bar a little higher and or whatever, just try to get a conversation going. That's been really good to because things that we thought we knew about the chair that we wanted them to sit in, they actually knew more about that chair than we knew. You know what I mean? They were actually showing us things and, and introducing us to software and product and stuff. It was like, so glad we weren't here trying to train somebody. We found somebody who was an expert at sitting in that chair and they're actually improving our thoughts immeasurably, you know, so. Totally. When you're, when you're doing LinkedIn searches, you can physically type in company names and people whose resumes have past history in those companies will pop up. Right. So if you're like, I know, like I know personally, like college pro painters, student works painting, uh, all of the student painting organizations out there. If it, if I had a guy who's been doing that for three to four years, I know that they, st they went through a pretty rigorous process to be able to keep doing that. And I know that they probably built into them in a very unique way that not a lot of people have. I know that McDonald's has incredible management training and that people who have been through that management training for five, six years have probably got a pretty good, you know, box of tools to do, you know, job site management. So we definitely keyword search certain companies and then we'll message people that have that past experience for sure. So, okay. So we've been talking about a very, very small niche of what the overall big picture of what you do. Um, we've been talking about how to, generate decent resumes and find good help. Mm -hmm. But can you, can we step out of that conversation now? Let's just talk about what your overall business offers. And again, we're going to give, you're going to give away some, um, what was it? Some, some input on how to find the right person since we were talking about recruiting today. Um, go to 1000houses.com forward slash breakthrough. And, uh, but there's also here, you know, before we started talking about recruiting, you were offering a 30 minute free meeting to address uh, an individual's business and to try to narrow it down to a list of specific things that they need to focus on in their business to, to, to move up or to move forward or to <clears throat> streamline. Yep. So talk about that part of the, that part of the, what that meeting would be like. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I find most entrepreneurs are, kind of like crazy ADD, dyslexic, idea-driven, action-oriented people, right? And they're like, I want to build a business. I want to get to, you know, X million dollars one year. And they're not realizing that the skill of doing what they're doing right now, which is often kind of a glorified job for themselves, requires a lot more finesse on the back end. And you need usually an, implement an implementer or someone that understands, like almost like an engineer on the back end helping you. Um, my experience in this, so I'm, I'm the ADD entrepreneur, just so we're all clear. <laughs> I have, I have I'm a, guilty. yeah, so I, I am not, you know, some, some saint in what I personally can, can do and understand, but I have a background in, in franchising that blew me away in my experience, right? So from 18 to 25 years old, I built a painting franchise, then worked for corporate, had a, you know, hundreds of franchisees that I oversaw with a few other partners and it was incredible to just watch how much me and all these people were developing under a system that they, they had something to follow, which told them, this is where you're wrong. This is where you're right. This is the process you need. Here's the templates to go do it. Here's the tried and true strategies, just like execute, execute, execute. And they McDonaldized basically the process. Everything had a way to do it. And I call that just having the rails to run on. You know, when you've got a lot of ideas and you can like get, you know, derailed pretty quickly as an entrepreneur, it's nice to have somebody that just goes like exactly these two things, shut up about everything else, go, right? I have no problem taking action. I just need someone to give me some direction on it. So back when I was 18 years old, that was like my life until I was 25. And when I left uh, the franchise world, my idea that I really wanted to bring to the world was like, how do I build a franchise system without selling a franchise? And that became Breakthrough Academy. And so I've got, it's not just me. I've got two business partners that are incredible and really back me up in the things that I'm weak in. And then we've got about another 22 staff that um, a lot of them are more on the engineer side of, you know, running a business and really have the project management high level experience to kind of guide a lot of our members. So my job is, and we have a couple people in the sales team to do this, but we, we sit down and we want to understand what is actually going on in your business. What are the biggest challenges? It's often around recruitment, systemization, 
um, pulling away enough, having some time from the day to day, and then giving some people one or two things to go do. It doesn't have to be this big complicated thing, right? It's do this in the next two weeks. I'll, I'll talk to you after that. So yeah, that that's, that's, session, that's one of the, one of the main functions of a coach or a mentor in my opinion is to keep people from getting overwhelmed. Like, let's don't worry about that right now. Well, I know how to do that over there, but you're not even there yet. Why don't, let's just, you know, let's just do this part. You know, I have people like, how do you sell notes? I said, well, you don't even have a note yet to sell. So let's just wait till you get a <laughs> note. And then I, I, I got it handled up. We can get you through that process. No problem. But you don't need to worry about that right now. First down, we need to figure out how you're going to buy a house and create a note. So, um, so I, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, uh, I, f I think you have a great service and from everyone I've talked to that, you know, I don't know a lot of people that you've dealt with, but the people that I know that you've dealt with, they really, um, speak highly of your, your work. Thanks, and so that's why I want to have you back. And I just happen to be getting a lot of recruitment and systemization questions myself and from my people. So I thought, well, I kind of take what's happening in my day to day life and then I go out and search for that stuff and bring it back in, you know? So, uh, I'd like to thank everybody out there for stopping by to get you some Danny Kerr. And if you guys want to get either or both of those free offers, the, um, the, uh, little handout on, on how to hone in on your recruiting and also a 30 minute meeting just to address your personal business and some of the key features that you might need to focus on and a checklist about what to do about it. Then go to 1000houses.com forward slash breakthrough. Um, again, Danny Kerr, thank you very much for coming on. I'd like to thank everybody out there for stopping by to get you some Danny Kerr. And uh, I'd like to thank taxfreefuture.com for sponsoring the show. If you do not have a tax-free uh, environment or, or tax-deferred environment to grow your finances, you need to check it out. You won't believe what your financial advisors are not telling you. We're going to tell you what they're not telling you. We're going to tell you why they're not telling you. And then you can do with it what you want, but uh, it's going to be eye-opening. Thank you very much, Danny. Got it, Steve. Or Mitch. <laughs> oh, lifelong hazard. That happens to me every, all the time. So don't even flinch. Uh, all right, right man. I appreciate yeah. you. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.